You're live. Yes. Oh. This feels weird because we haven't done this. Oh, my hair is crazy. <laughs> we haven't done this in a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, two months. Bad Santa was the last um, live review. So uh -huh. wel welcome back. The theme for this live was best picture winners I have not seen. Mm -hmm. So the options were Kramer versus Kramer, The Deer Hunter, Midnight Cowboy, Unforgiven, and American Beauty. And American Beauty got 43%. Um, beauty. I would have been happy with all of these. Uh, American Beauty was the one I was least interested of those five in revisiting, but uh, I would, yeah. But uh, but it was nice to, I haven't seen it since 2000, so. It came out in 99. Mm -hmm. the, one, one best picture, it's a debut film from it, Sam Mendes. Did it win any other Academy Awards? I believe uh, cinematography for Conrad Hall, and then of course, Kevin Spacey's second uh, Oscar win, he won best actor. Oh, mm -hmm. well. What is the premise? A sexually frustrated suburban father has a midlife crisis after becoming infatuated with his daughter's best friend. Um, I, I didn't know what this movie was about, except that I knew that there was like a shocking ending. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't quite what I expected it to be, but yeah, it's about Kevin Spacey who's married to Annette Benning. And they seem to have the perfect life. They live in a beautiful house with a beautiful yard. And he works in advertising. Annette Benning's a real estate agent. They have a teenage daughter. But a, upon like very superficial examination, it's clear that their lives are not perfect. To say the least, yeah. Because Kevin Spacey's job is in jeopardy. And he's clearly not happy there. And Annette Benning is really trying to like work her way up to be a successful real estate agent. So there's contention there. Their daughter played by- Thora Birch. Thora Birch. She seems unhappy. Like she's very disconnected from her parents. They don't seem, especially Annette Benning. she seems kind of like not a nice lady towards her daughter because she's very critical of her. There's a lot of resentment in this family. <laughs> so they have, neighbors who just moved in this veteran this marine veteran his wife and their teenage son played by wes bentley and then his, the west uh chris cooper and allison janney are those parents so wes bentley takes a liking to thora birch and he's like he he's a drug dealer so he has a bunch of money but of course his marine corps dad doesn't know that he thinks he just does like odd jobs on the weekends but somehow can afford all this uh video equipment but Wes Bentley likes to video record people and he's been he's a little bit of a voyeur with Thora Birch mm -hmm. but they end up connecting voyeur peeping Tom peeping Tom <laughs> and the opening of the film is Wes Bentley recording Thora Birch and she basically says like I would love for like do you want to kill my dad <laughs> so as the audience it's like oh so that's what's going to happen because then it's followed by narration from Kevin Spacey saying that he's going to die a year from now. And this is his story. So we already know what's going to happen. We just don't know who's doing it, but it's important to know that Thora Birch has a new friend played by Mina Suvari. Yes. And she's made to seem like a little bit of a, like a little slut or something. And she takes a liking to Kevin Spacey, which excites him because his marriage is not happy. Clearly, he and his wife are not having sex. Uh, and it's obvious that, like to everyone, that he's attracted to this girl. But everything culminates in one night. Kevin Spacey is buying marijuana from Wes Bentley. So one day while Wes Bentley's at home, his beeper goes off and he's like, oh, I have to go to the neighbor's house. My girlfriend needs a book. But his Marine Corps dad is suspicious and he goes in his room and sees some video cassettes and starts playing them. And one of the video cassettes is of Kevin Spacey working out naked in the garage. 
And we, we had already seen that the Marine Corps guy is super homophobic because there are some gay neighbors, Scott Bakula and, and his, his partner. partner, and we hear the Marine Corps <laughs> guy saying some really nasty things. So the, the, the Marine Corps dad is looking through the window and he sees his son go over to see Kevin Spacey and Kevin Spacey is shirtless and it's like a rainy night and there's an obstructed view. So from the dad's perspective, it looks like his son is performing oral sex on Kevin Spacey, but that's not what's happening. Wes Bentley's just rolling a marijuana joint. So when Wes Bentley returns, his dad like beats him up and tells him like, I'll, I'll throw you out before I have a gay son. And then Wes Bentley is like, oh, my dad will let me leave <laughs> if he thinks I'm gay. He wants that because Wes Bentley has a bunch of money saved up from drug dealing and he hates his home life. So he pretends to be gay so his dad will let him leave. And then everything sort of settles down and we see Kevin Spacey. During that time, he attempts to have sex with Mina Suvari. Mm -hmm. But then that stops, which we can talk about. So now Kevin Spacey's in the garage, shirtless, working out, smoking weed. When the Marine Corps dad comes over in the rain, crying, and basically makes a pass at Kevin Spacey, like tries to kiss him. Mm -hmm. And Kevin's like, whoa, 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 you got the wrong idea. I'm not like that. And then we see Kevin Spacey get shot in the head and killed. But we don't know who did it. So then we get a little montage of everyone involved and what they were doing when the gun went off. And we see that the last person to react is the Marine Corps dad. Mm -hmm. So he did it. And we see him covered in blood wearing gloves. And that's the end of the film. Yeah, this is not what I expected. I, I Again, I knew there was like a surprise mm -hmm. ending and I knew that there was like an inappropriate relationship. But yeah. I expected the gay component to be stronger because of the gay neighbors. Sure. Yeah. They're just, uh, I mean, this is very much a, a time capsule of a film because I was in ninth grade when this came out and even watching this, I remember renting it with my parents then the gay couple who of course are uh, shown to be the kind of most boring but stable element of this uh, little dysfunctional community. Uh, but to me, it, it was uncomfortable to watch my parents then, but it, it's the film is saying a lot uh, in where we were with dealing with queer acceptance for sure. It's a gay panic film. Sure. Uh, overall, I think the film made me, like the overall theme I got from it was about feeling trapped. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, the American Beauty roses, which are prone to, uh, which are beloved for their beauty, but are, are prone to rot. Uh, right underneath the surface. I guess talking about every character. So Kevin Spacey seems trapped in his marriage because it seems to have evolved in a way that doesn't seem to align with what he wanted because he doesn't seem to be like a very loving dad. And then he comments about Annette Benning changing, like that he wishes she were that girl he met in college. So I think he's just trapped by this idea of what a family's supposed to be like. He clearly is sexually frustrated. The idea of smoking marijuana feels really good to him. He's first introduced to it at a party, like one of Annette Benning's parties, where Wes Bentley is like a cater waiter, and he offers Kevin Spacey marijuana. And you can see that he feels alive. Like, he's talking to a young guy. He's just shooting the shit. So it seems like he's really trapped in this idea of what it is to be this middle-aged married man with a child who has to provide for this upper-middle-class life they have. And then Annette Benning seems like she wants to be more than like, like someone's wife or mother. She's just kind of, it seems like embracing the possibility that she could be something. But it seems important to her that she has like this perfect life. Right? Status. Because like, yeah. the first time we meet her, she's being meticulous about her roses. And then she seems concerned about the car and the the couch and the way her daughter looks and acts and I, I think the biggest symbol of her feeling trapped is her hair because her hair is a literal nightmare, <laughs> but it makes perfect sense because a, a person like her would be overstyled, like, like would do too much because she thinks that that's necessary. So I actually thought that her hairstyles made a lot of sense in this movie. Mm -hmm. Then the daughter, Thora Birch, 
feels like a very standard teenage experience. Like my parents don't know me because they're involved in their own nonsense. Yeah, yeah, they're consumed with themselves, yeah. And then she seems to not fit in at school. So she seems lonely, so trapped in that. Like trapped in being misunderstood and, and lonely. Then Wes Bentley, I mean, his abusive dad. And then Allison Janney, I don't know what's supposed to be her deal. She seems... She's worn down to nothing, yeah. I mean, beyond that, it yeah. almost seems like Wendy Williams at this point. Like she just seems out of it and... Well, she seems medicated. And medicated, yeah. like maybe she was lobotomized. I don't know. And then, of course, the Marine Corps dad, I think, has some latent repressed feelings. That oh, for sure. He's trapped by... And that's why, I mean, I think it manifests in him being so strict and homophobic because he can't just be free. And then Mina Suvari, you had said she's trapped by her beauty because she thinks that's the only thing she has to offer. You no, know, Beyonce did tell us that pretty hurts, but... Uh... Yeah, she she she's stuck feeling that that that's the only thing she has to offer, and to her peers, I mean, she's boring and ordinary. And I think that's why that moment where Kevin Spacey Lester is telling her like, "Oh, you're anything but ordinary." She does have something to offer, but it's not just that, and clearly something she has to learn. I'm just going to go through my notes. We get a little montage of because Annette Benning is stressing out that she needs to sell a house, like she needs to make some money. I'm going to sell this house today. So. Uh, seeing her get amped up about selling the house, I thought was really well done. And then we get a montage of different people looking at this house. One in particular is a lesbian couple who are upset because in the advertisement for the house, it's it reads that the pool is like a lagoon-like setting. <laughs> and I thought it was really funny that the lesbians are like, this ain't no lagoon. They are stuck on the lagoon. Yeah. Uh, but it's also like, how many houses have you looked at, ladies, uh, where they are advertising it in a way to get you there? Uh, but I kind of thought that represented like, you know, like, like people wanting like a very specific thing and just like letting that derail. Because even like watching House Hunters on HGTV or going out and, you know, how many homes have we looked at in the process of buying some homes like where you see other people there and the little things people complain about. And it's like, you could build, you could change those cabinets. You could redo that carpeting. Like, look at the big picture. Yes. Like, is this going to work for you? So I, I thought it was funny that we got like an extended scene of that one couple obsessing about the pool. Like, is that all you care about is right. having a waterfall? Like, But living in LA, that seems to be, people are that sometimes stuck on pools. Uh, another part of the, uh, that montage is a young John Cho. That's right. Uh, the gay couple, Scott Bakula and his partner, uh, they are a tax attorney and an anesthesiologist. And yeah, I thought it was funny that they represent the most stability and nor normalcy in this world we're in. Um, Wes is, I mean, he seems like a little sociopath in the making. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how he could live through some things he did without having some significant dysfunction. No, but you know, it, it's kind of alarming, like, because I, in addition to feeling like this film is about feeling trapped, I also think it's meant to be sort of like a hyper-realized version of American life. Well, how we are trained to be two different people, like we have to have different or more different personas because all the teenagers are, like Thora is the one that hasn't, uh, had to craft herself so strongly as like the Mina Suvari or Wes Bentley, where their their reflection to the world at large is uh, very ingrained and standardized. Yeah, yeah. Well, and just like the like what's underneath the surface, you know, because I listen to so much Dateline and it's like every family seems perfect. And when you hear people who are familiar with the cases, they're like, oh, John and Sally were so perfect. They seem so happy. And their daughter was a cheerleader. And then when you get one page in, it's like, actually, <laughs> there was abuse and infidelity and drug use. And it just seems like the reality of most people's lives is not this perfect thing we all try to present. So it's funny that we can't, I can see how in 1999, this film probably had a lot of impact because it's like a, a like a glance behind this obvious, a, a glance behind the curtain that I think we all know exists. Ends in a contemporary way. But I mean, I prefer a film from two years before this a lot more called The Ice Storm, which is ostensibly doing very similar things. 
but sets in 1973. The the scene where Kevin is working out naked in the garage is precipitated by Mina Suvari telling him like that she likes muscles. And her flirting with him is interesting because it's very blatant. She's clearly playing a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She knows the reaction she'll receive. When, so we find out that Wes Bentley got in trouble sometime before related to like using marijuana, which they're acting as like hardcore drugs. But we see that now he has to have like urine tests. So there's a scene where his dad um, kind of barges in on him and says, I need a urine sample. And then his son's like, yeah, no problem. Sorry, my door was locked because the dad is upset that he has like a locked door. And so Wes is like, oh, I, I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Nothing's going on. I'll have the urine sample for you in the morning because I already took a whiz. And then it seems like the dad is going to tell him something. And then he stops and walks out of the room. What did you think he was going to tell him? I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what people think the dad was going to tell Wes when he gave him the urine sample. Because he's real pensive and he pauses for a while. Like he's going to say something and then it's like, okay, fine, and then leaves. So that kind of, that, I, I found that intriguing. Because I, 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 I almost got the sense not knowing that this was going to lead to him maybe being like a closeted homosexual. I almost thought that the dad was going to ask Wes about his sexuality and or, or maybe share something about his own. Well, he's always kind of, he he's clearly so pent up and wants to communicate, but always, uh, of course, uh, not doing so. But so who knows? I don't know that someone like him would have a moment where he'd ask his son what he likes. Sexually. Maybe not. There's a scene where Kevin and Annette are in the bed and Annette is asleep and Kevin is masturbating and then she awakens and then she's upset by it. And I thought that was interesting because that felt like another way he's trapped like he can't he doesn't have control over his body he can't get what he wants but he also can't like i, I found her reaction to him doing that really unreasonable yes. and i and i felt like you know part of the reason why he's probably grown to hate her and because at the moment where he decides to kind of like speak up to her is that moment mm -hmm. and that's when they talk about getting a divorce and he says, like, you're not going to divorce me after everything. Like, what have I done? I haven't cheated on you. I don't hit you. I haven't done anything. You're the one who doesn't give me what I want. And then I put you through real estate school. So I'm sure a judge would think that you owe me half your shit. And that's when she's like, what? That's how you feel? Mm -hmm. And that's when he realizes, like, he needs to. Because then I got the sense that maybe for the entirety of their marriage, he always took a back seat to whatever she wanted. And that's how they got in this predicament with a $4,000 couch he doesn't care about and a, driving a Toyota Camry he doesn't want. Italian silk. So yeah, I, I thought that was a very powerful scene. When Kevin Spacey goes to West Bentley to buy weed, he so first he gives him like a bag of like weed that he's like, oh, this is like standard, you know, decent weed. And the big bag was $300. That's a lot of weed. That was a lot of weed, but I don't know what weed. I mean, I've purchased cannabis, but not like that. So that price seemed like a lot because then he says, or oh, I have this quality stuff. It's, it's called like G13. Government grade, whatever. And Kevin Space is like, oh, is that what we smoked the other day? And Wes is like, yeah, that's all I smoked. Some sativa. And it was like a little sa uh, sachet. And it was $2,000. Ain't no way. The, we, the, is that what weed costs? I, not any that I ever bought. Because uh, I bought 20 bags of edibles. Mm -hmm. And I think I spent like like 20, 20 bags that were like had 20 10 milligram gummies in each bag. And I, and I think I paid like $300. On the regulated market, though. <laughs> Two thousand dollars for a little bitty. Bag. This is nineteen ninety nine, and marijuana was, uh, you know, uh, a big deal. I guess maybe that's partially why, because <laughs> it also just seems so suburban because of that. It's like, oh, we're piss testing this kid because of weed. Like, Two thousand dollars. I would have taken that money and gone to Jamaica and taken a two week vacation and just smoked all the weed I wanted. If I were Kevin, like, yeah, I'll just need to calm down and and be glad this child is not doing something harder. <laughs> I thought it was pretty dark that, you know, clearly the Marine Corps dad is homophobic and controlling. And a Nazi. And I'm sure abusive. But then we see 
Wes break into his dad's like collectibles cabinet and he wants to show Thor Birch something. And it's like a Nazi plate, like some China that the Nazis had and that his dad collects it. Well, it's his only piece of Nazi paraphernalia Mm -hmm. or memorabilia. I wondered why he did that. Do you think he was trying to show Thor like how effed up his dad is? Or did he think it was cool? I think they're kind of trauma bonding, those two. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like, how, yeah, how effed up is my dad? Like, yeah. Uh, and maybe trying to show her that her maybe her situation isn't so bad as she believes. Yeah. Uh, but then when the dad realizes that his son broke into the cabinet, he beats the shit out of him. It was, it was kind of, I mean, it was jarring. Yeah, but it's almost like the, I don't know, who who has just one piece of Nazi paraphernalia? I don't know. <laughs> well, why? There's a point, because uh, there's like a an argument at dinner where Kevin Spacey gets up and gets mad. And like, after that, Annette is upset and she's talking to her daughter. And the daughter says something smart to her. And Annette slaps the shit out of her. She goes, I don't feel like having a Kodak moment, mom. And the daughter, like, like you can tell it like it sent her over the edge. That's- Which made me laugh because I thought if I plotted a murder every time my mom hit me, the entire neighborhood would have been massacred. Like, <laughs> it's just funny how people react to certain, like what some people consider trauma and what some people acclimate to. Or what's and, what's normalized. Yeah, what's normalized, what, what connects with us. I mean, some things people do and say to me don't really register. And then other things I can't forget. And like, that will be like the thing that will end it all. So I, I just find it funny that that's, her mom slapping her was like <laughs> the scene prior with the dinner plate throwing. I was stuck on the asparagus on a bed of uh, sliced lemons. It's like God, you had to waste all those lemons. To well, pre- she to present that asparagus, but that makes sense because look at her hair. Well, right. Like, I just mean, like you're doing so you're much. You're doing extra. way too much. Um, then, so Annette Benning, there's this real estate agent played by Peter Gallagher, who's like. The main, like the, the 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 head cheese of real estate in whatever town they live in, and she ends up having like a sexual affair with him. And at one point, he tells her, I'll, "I blow off steam by going to the shooting range." So then we see Annette Benning going to the shooting range, and we get a scene of her like let like she really enjoys shooting that gun, which I thought was creepy. Yes. Uh, well, because I, my dad was an avid hunter and we, we grew up, I grew up shooting a lot of guns, but that shooting never made me feel powerful. I think it's very, uh, I don't know. It, 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 made, it always made me a kind of a, a little bit uncomfortable. It's scary to shoot a gun when you realize how powerful it is and like how it, it's just so easy to. Oh God. I remember shooting a semi-automatic. <laughs> <laughs> I had never shot a gun until I shot a gun with your dad. And then I was like, I, I, I couldn't believe how easy. First of all, the gun felt weird. It was heavy and big. There, there's a recoil. Yeah. And then and then it just was like so easy to pull the trigger. And I, I don't know. I went through a lot of emotions of like, it's just so easy to pull that trigger. And then if there was someone in front of it and it killed them, it just happened like nothing. You didn't have to do anything but go like this and... <laughs> Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like if you want to kill someone, you need to do it with your bare hands. Like <laughs> if you're going to kill somebody, you need to do it with your bare hands. Make it an intimate moment. Yeah. yeah. Um the a moment that uh really hit me was so Kevin ends up resigning from his job and then kind of strong arming them to give him a really nice severance package. He he basically blackmails them, saying, I know a lot of dirty shit that went on around here. And if I reported it, I'm sure no one would be happy. So what you're going to do is pay me a year's salary and give me some health benefits. Which is under 60K, which sounds so like... That's a lot of money in 1999. In Chicago? Okay. So the so now he has all this free time and this money, and he ends up still getting a job working at Mr. Smiley's, which is like a burger, like, like a fast food joint. But we see him go and buy a new car. He buys a 1970 Pontiac Firebird, which is a really cool car and makes, I related to that because that's a car that he coveted in his, in his youth, in his teenage years. Yeah, this is a very midlife, white male midlife crisis. And I felt like I could, like, it, it made me sad for him. Like, it seems like I, I can relate to feeling like what I want in life seems so simple in my head, but I just can't have it. 
Mm-hmm. And like everyone and everything makes everything so difficult for me to just have the very simple thing I want. And I feel like what Kevin Spacey seemed to want is so simple. Like it just like, can my wife be nice to me? Can she have sex with me kind of on the regular? Mm-hmm. Can she let me drive a car I like? And can I put my feet on the coffee table? Like, Well, it's funny watching both of them. They're both part of the problem of their current situation. But it's it's funny how they're both not able to let go of she can't let go of the man she wants him to be, and he can't let go of the image of the woman that she was. It's like, if y'all just kind of communicated and talked through that. Well, that's the thing. When she comes home and sees the car, I thought that was a funny scene because the way she stands in the hallway, oh, yeah, she's, she's posing like she's mad. She's about to go off. And it's almost like that moment could have been the moment when they are honest with each other. And they almost are. And they almost are. And then it just devolves because she gets upset about the couch. And Kevin almost spilling. Well, they beer. both get upset, and, and then, you know they they can't de-escalate clearly. Well, I mean, I think the unfortunate reality is people grow apart, and you know the the, the thing that brought them together is now gone. Well, they still At, to to no fault of either party. Like, I mean, you just have to become an adult. Like, we can't all, you know, what's the story he said? Oh, remember when you used to pretend to be have seizures at parties when you were bored? That's right. Like. Yeah. Which is kind of funny. It is funny. And it's it's some, you know, you have friends who sometimes you'll say, oh, we used to go to the grocery store and yell out this. And that's a memory you have. And it is fun. And I don't want to do that anymore. But you wouldn't do it now as a, you know, 20 years later. Go have an improv scene in the cheese aisle. Yeah. Yeah. No. So it's like holding on to, I mean, I, I think that's the thing that no one tells you about becoming an adult and building a life with someone is like things are going to change and that person's going to change and you're going to change and you're probably not going to like how all of that evolves so who's going to prepare you for that i I think this movie is a very hyper realized version of what that looks like and and realizing that you don't you can't always get what you want you know you get what you need uh but yeah uh at one point thora birch describes her dad because she's venting to Wes about how he acts around Mina Suvari. She says he's a horny geek boy who sprays his shorts whenever I bring a girlfriend over. I Some of the right. So this is Sam Mendes's debut, who you've seen several many films of his, including two Bond movies, Skyfall Inspector, Revolutionary Road. Um, I think the teens uh, feel, especially like some of Wes Bentley's, like that soliloquy feel very overwritten. I agree. So I do agree with that. They do feel like that, but I think it works because if this is supposed to, I almost felt like all of these characters are an amalgamation of a lot of like, I I think we're supposed to see all of these characters as like a symbol of something we can pull from. Sure. So that's why they're all a little over the top. Wes Bentley is the most over the top in my opinion, but yeah, I agree. He in particular feels overwritten, but. Oh, when, when Kevin Spacey first pulls up to Smiley's, do you remember the ads in the window? Yeah, you get free napkins. Free napkins. <laughs> well, nowadays. Add cheese. <laughs> nowadays, like, you, you have to ask for everything. You have to ask for a straw, ketchup, everything. Where were we just at where I, you, I, you could see into the back of the kitchen and there was a sign on the wall that says, straws only upon request. Like, we cannot waste this plastic. Well, I mean, the turtles. So... The totals. Thora, Thora Birch is in the beginning looking up like breast augmentation. Mm-hmm. And then we actually see her breast at a point. So then I thought, does she want a breast reduction? I would assume it's a reduction. I mean, she had lovely breasts. I don't, mm-hmm. but, but, but again, it makes sense for a teenager to obsess about their appearance and have an unrealistic <laughs> view of what their body looks like. And did you ever see now and then I don't, with uh, Christina Ricci and her all those women? Christina Ricci's binding her breasts in that movie. Oh no, Kevin Spacey working at Mr. Smiley's. The uh, the manager at the 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 restaurant, like the shift manager, is played by that lady from Hairspray, mm-hmm. M- uh, Moniker, or yeah, which I thought because this is ninety because Hairspray the musical was 07. and she looked the same. Winnaker, that's her yeah. last name. Um, but <laughs> Annette messed up because she's in the drive through with her lover boy, and they're flirting and. Kevin can hear in his headset. And then when they pull up to get their food and pay, they're like fondling and kissing each other. And Kevin catches them. He hears her voice and he runs right over. I like that scene. That's a good scene. Cause he didn't overreact. I, I felt like it just empowered him to be like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do what I want to do then. Mm-hmm. 
but uh, and immediately how Peter Gallagher and that Benning are after that is just like, oh, this isn't fun anymore. So the scene towards the end when after she's been caught cheating, so now she's and then who's the guy she's cheating with? Peter Gallagher. He tells her like, we we probably should stop this because I'm gonna end up. I'm in the middle of a messy divorce. Like, I, we, let's just stop. So now she's upset for those reasons. It's raining. She's in her Mercedes SUV crying with her gun on the seat. And she keeps saying, I refuse to be a victim. I refuse to be a, be a victim, which reminded me of Got to Be Real mm-hmm. when Fantasia says, I refuse to be the suspect. <laughs> but then, of course, for sure, I thought, oh, she's going to shoot and kill Kevin Spacey. But of course, it wasn't. And then when she comes home and sees his dead body, she goes upstairs and like throws her purse with the gun in a box. Mm-hmm. And then she sort of collapses in grief. In his clothes. She's smelling his clothes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I thought also is it's that weird thing of like being in a relationship and like knowing like 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 those moments when you want it to be over, but then something reminds you of why it, it means something to you. And I I felt like her smelling those clothes was that for her. Like like the like the thought of him means something to her, but clearly these two people probably don't belong together. Well, they need to be more realistic with each other for sure. I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, I don't know that they could not be happy. I just think that they would need to rework their lives. But the reality is, most people in relationships can't do that. Like you can't reset. No. Well, it's also born out of control. Like even the masturbation scenes. Like how dare you do that? give pleasure to your body, even though she's not doing anything to give him pleasure. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, this is a story about control. What would you give this movie? Uh, three and a half. Um, it, it's of its moment uh, that year. I, I feel like the Oscar maybe should have gone to the insider of the five movies nominated, but I don't know. I would give it four out of five. Okay. Do you want to... Uh... Well, someone had a tough night last night. Well, I hope they're feeling better. Hello, NYC, Denver. Oh, South Mississippi. Mm. Phoenix. What's the weather like in Phoenix? Uh, Someone thought this movie was about a horse. (laughs) Thank you, BMCK. Hello, Ireland. Secretariat. Oh, Finland? Wow. Someone likes your blue shirt. Okay. Someone finally made a live. Oh, someone's from uh, in Berlin. Oh, I was just there. Toronto. I love Toronto. Oh, Deer Hunter has the same cinematographer as The Rose. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I, because we watched Dune 2 with Christopher Walken. It's, it's too bad Deer Hunter didn't win because uh, that's his Oscar win as well. And he's pretty fantastic in it. I thought Wes Bentley was good looking. His eyes are very... He's like, intense. He's intense. And, you know, come to find... He would have a, a considerable drug problem after this that derailed his career for a while. Is there another Thor Birch movie <clears throat> I would know? Ghost World. Terry, I've seen that. Terry's wig off. No, we, we own it. It's on Criterion, but... So there isn't a movie I would know. Um, I just... Strangely, I just watched her in Patriot Games as a little girl this week as well. You've seen her in something. Oh, what did the, the the flying? So Wes Bentley shares. He tells Thora Birch, "Oh, do you want to see a video of the most beautiful thing I've ever seen?" Oh God, that's and then yeah. it's a plastic bag, like in a little. Uh, what do you call those little sand or uh, wind whirlwinds? Whirlwinds, mm-hmm. whatever. What do you think that meant? Because I didn't. What he was talking, like I don't that see there, it, girl. that. There's so much beauty in just. Nothing in, every, in, in everyday life. If you just look, there's beauty in every moment to be seen and every gesture of the of nature. Uh, I mean, and that's also ironically not a very pretty looking scene. No, uh, but cl- I think uh, this is written by Alan Ball, uh, who I believe it's also who his debut would go on to write Six Feet Under, which you haven't seen as excellent series. But I think my that, mom started watching Six Feet Under and she likes it. It's good. Um, but I think that bag spinning scene is also the image that inspired Ball to write the story. I, yeah. I I think it's that that's the scene that feels kind of the most overwritten to me. That the, the, the that, that should have been the moment where Sam Mendes killed his darling, kind of, and cut that. But welcome home, Nick. My hair is my hair is doing something. 
I washed it last night, so that's why it's so puffy. You know what it's doing? It's growing. Unlike some of us that don't have that. Uh, oh, Mina Stuvari talks about this film in her autobiography. Does she have a good experience? Uh, Annette Benning is the original Karen. <laughs> Yeah, I do really like Annette Benning. And, and this was, of course, the first of two times she would lose an Oscar to Hilary Swank. Uh, uh, who, we'll see. She's currently nominated right now for Nyad. Someone's walking their dog down Riverside Drive. Um, I could see people not liking this movie, um, feeling uncomfortable with the subject matter. Well, it's just funny looking back in 1999 and... Um, you know, the, if somebody, if you were in a small town or in a small community and you revealed that you were gay, like Chris Cooper killing Kevin Spacey in this is very, like he, he can't have this man out there with the knowledge that uh, he knows he's gay and not also benefit from it. So that that's kind of where the, kind of the panic part of it comes from. And I, I don't know, like it just, I remember watching that then and that felt very, of course, this is this is normal and this is reality. And looking back twenty some years later, it's like, oh, what would you give Forrest Gump? It's not on your letterbox. It's because uh, I haven't watched it also in a couple decades now, but uh, maybe two and a half. I really don't care for Forrest Gump. I don't really like Tom Hanks. This one was commentary on acquiring a checkbox life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the picket fences syndrome. Yeah. But yeah, 1999 was a really great year. Eyes Wide Shut, The Straight Story, Magnolia, A Map of the World. Mm, Sigourney. Bringing Out the Dead. I don't know that movie. Yeah, uh, it's Scorsese. That's, yeah, you do. That's where Nicolas Cage is the ambulance driver with John Goodman. Someone's smoking out right now. That means you're smoking marijuana. <gasps> <laughs> Smoke, oh, someone else smoking herb while listening to me talk about herb. <laughs> Someone's hair is a little nightmare. I never had a good hair day. <laughs> Will there be an Oscar prediction show? Uh, uh, probably not. I mean, maybe I would make a live about the winners. Maybe. I don't necessarily even want to watch the Oscars again. Yeah, I don't either. Do you want to explain why you called this a gay panic film? I just did. Oh. Uh, let's see here. Oh, people like our shirts. Thank you. Oh, Pleasantville. Yeah, that was the year before this. I could rewatch that. The, okay, so the dad being pensive was probably, he was expecting some rebellion and the kids sabotaged that by being fake respectful. Oh, yeah. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, you can tell that Wes Bentley's character knows how to... Uh, disarm his father like in the car talking about the gay couple as well it's like he knows what to say oh yeah happiness with todd salon's film that's a better film i think and that was the year before and you know watching that's that's a very daring film um was weed better or worse in the 90s i don't know uh well i feel like you you well because nowadays you know what you're getting right yeah you also didn't know especially stupid teenagers running around. I mean, I remember several many friends getting a bag that looked like what Wes Bentley had and it was straight up parsley. It's like, you dum-dums. Okay, I'm getting lost. There, oh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Someone's breaking down the cost of their weed. <laughs> I don't their THC. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, uh, well, we haven't done lives because we have to dedicate time to the Patreon. So we have to, or we want to, so, but maybe like a live a month could be doable and be alive once a month. Peter Gallagher's eyebrows, uh, had a great performance. Yes. He's the male equivalent of Brooke Shields with them eyebrows. And I remember thinking he was very handsome, like in the while you were sleeping era. Uh, Two thousand for weed could emphasize how suburbanized and out of touch he had become. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, he can charge those prices to uh, white middle class people in the suburbs. Who are they all? Who are they going to go to instead? Yeah. What are we drinking today? Coffee and sun-kissed orange, zero sugar. And I'm drinking cinnamon tea. Spice. Melange tea. Melange tea. tea. <laughs> My collar's crispy. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it has those little things in it that I always lose. Oh, God, I used to have a job where I had to wear a shirt and tie. Well, I had two jobs, so there was like a five-year period where I had to wear a shirt and tie. Ugh. And a suit. For, so for one, actually, for two years, I had to wear a shirt and tie and tuck in my shirt into like slacks. And then for four more years, I had to wear a full suit. Ugh. And that was living in Las Vegas. Ugh. Walking outside in the oven. <laughs> well, I mean, the good thing was, you know, the casino, I was in a casino, so it was always cold. But then, yeah, going to my car would be like, oh, I got to take all this stuff off before I even mm -hmm. do my car. <laughs> What do you mean by the character being overwritten? Uh, it doesn't feel, it's not authentic. It's uh, overbaked. Like if you overcook food, almost <laughs> like it's too, uh, it's been tinkered with too much. It just feels uh, the, the original intention is lost in, uh, it, it, it's, it's overwritten. <laughs> Hello, Vancouver and Grand Blanc, Michigan. What does this mean? Anyone disappointed in the lack of smooth cat milking in Dune Two? Smooth. Is, is there that in the? Is that is there a smooth cat in the book? The smooth cat. Uh, I don't remember any cats in the book, but oh, someone enjoys our Patreon. Thank you. Thor Birch was in Hocus Pocus. Yeah. So is Vanessa Shaw. Oh, the plastic bag scene me uh, meant. There's cathedrals everywhere for those with eyes to see. Uh, oh, Johannesburg. Wow. Joburg. Benny Ford. I rented this once as a teenager and never watched it again. I didn't like the messages, permissions it was sending to gay people and straight people. That message left an impact on me. Wait. Oh, I've never seen that where it's two messages. Mm. Oh, to a point, oh God, I'm so lost. To a point of paranoia about other people's sexuality. I remember it seeming more harmful than helpful to those times. Yeah, and it was written by a gay man. Um, but but again, I think that it shows the the, the restrictions of the time as well. What, yeah, I could see attitudes being different 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like This felt very, to even have like this gay couple that's, normal and happy and living together and stable i think it was also important to see as a gay kid at that time like oh there is the possibility to just create your own stability if you want to uh because there weren't things at least at this level in american cinema that were reflecting that in the late 90s well even when the marine corps dad is when the because at a point, Kevin Spacey is going jogging with the gay couple. And then when the Marine Corps dad sees them, he's like, what is this? The gay pride parade? Why do these F slurs have to flaunt it? Blah, blah, blah. And I could see people in 1999 probably thinking, like, not disagreeing with him so much. Well, yeah, I think watching with my parents, like, those weren't subversive moments. They were just like, yeah, that's, that's what we right. do, too. Whereas now, I mean, even, you know, even people who may not necessarily align themselves with opposite ideas would still probably think that that's harsh like mm -hmm. so yeah it, it's interesting life is a house oh my god the hayden christensen performance in that is terrible do you think paul giamatti has a chance at best actor i think he has a pretty good chance yeah i don't know who else is nominated you do oh. you, you can you'd have to refresh your memory but i think you've seen most of them <laughs> Oh. Weed is stronger now. Well, yeah, you can get. There's so many strains. Levels, yeah. Uh, did we talk about anatomy of a fall? I think we did on a podcast yes. episode because mm -hmm. I watched it on my own separately. Yeah, I saw it. I saw a can. Oh, green tea with ginger sounds good. Oh, Magnolia. I've been wanting, I'll probably have to do a secret film for the podcast for Magnolia. I've been really wanting to rewatch that. Great. That might be my favorite P.T. Anderson. 
We're going to talk about the Dune 2021 mm-hmm. in the movies we watched for fun mm-hmm. on Patreon. And then we're going to review Dune 1984 for Patreon. Have you had a chance to watch that movie where the man sends the other man home to kill his children? I, I have not, but we do plan to with Ida Lupino, where that his war buddy says like, if, "Oh yeah, yeah, if yeah." If my if my wife gets remarried, kill my children. <laughs> what do you think about all the tea coming out about Diddy? Well, I was reading this morning about like Meek Mill and some other. <laughs> that's I, been that's been a slow leak, hasn't it? Well, I mean, it's just so curious. Like, if he's that. I don't know. It just seems like it's very curious to me that more concrete stuff hasn't come out sooner. And still there isn't like a lot of concrete stuff, like for him to have these wild parties. Cause I heard one person talking about how, like there was some personality who did a podcast and talked about how he was at one of Diddy's parties. And they told him like, Oh, don't make, make sure you leave before 1am because that's when things change. But then he was like in the studio late and then like he was at the house, but like downstairs in a studio or something and then came up after midnight and there were all these men having sex. And I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if, if the question is like, do I think Diddy's gay? Where's the problem? I mean, I don't know. I, <clears throat> yeah. Whatever. I mean, I've heard, you hear stories about, I mean, I've heard stories about Jamie Foxx. Like, I don't know that I care about Diddy, you know, like enough to be curious about what he's doing. Right. I don't know. Just go buy some more of his pants. Sean John. Do they still make that? Uh, do they make? Sh- I'd be surprised if, sh- thank you, BMCK. I don't know if. Sean John is still a thing. Oh, the Risa Tisa saga on TikTok. I almost last night, because all of her TikToks combined total like six and a half hours. So then I'm like, do I want to commit to six and a half hours? No. No. So then I was trying to find like a summary video and I couldn't find one that I liked. So I actually don't know anything about Risa Tisa. I, I know that. So there's this woman on TikTok who did this like, several part series about her husband Mm -hmm. and it went super viral but now there's backlash but i don't know what the issue was so oh i guess i could watch it on double speed yeah there you go oh i'm sure yeah if i search reddit i was just on youtube but i'm sure if i went online i could find a good summary because i know she's on she was on the tamron hall show so clearly she's gone viral uh, oh yeah, Bentley Farnsworth knows all that to you about Diddy. I want he he said something recently that kind of like insinuated that he wasn't going to say anything, which of course is never good. Uh, La Dolce Vita I haven't watched in years. Um, I prefer Eight and a Half. We were talking about Fellini, but La Dolce, La Dolce Vita I think is something you have to see. Yeah, I mean, if Diddy's a predator, then of course that's a problem. Of course. But I don't, it it seems like all the conversation that I see when I'm on social media is like questioning his sexuality, which is like, well, I don't really care. And I feel like a lot of people do a lot of things that don't really match what they present. So, right. Yeah, I mean, if he's a. Would I be surprised? No. Yeah, if he's assaulting people, and that's obviously very different. we have not watched last night's drag race. Not yet. yet. Um, the Magnolia soundtrack, Amy, Ma- I remember having that CD soundtrack and listening to it. One is the loneliest number her cover. Very good. We have watched Melancholia. Mm-hmm. That was your favorite movie that year. Yeah, I like that movie. Yeah, J Lo. Well, J Lo wouldn't say anything. Although I was, I saw that in her little documentary, she was sort of calling out all the celebrities who didn't want to be in her movie. I, uh, I mean, and they should be validated after seeing it. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it on the Ugh. on the Patreon because you you watched her. This is me now. That was very hard to get. to. So you can talk about it, and then you can talk about. Uh, 
I, I can tell you all the people who didn't want to be in her movie. Let's talk about lack of self-awareness. Are we allowed to show movies on Patreon? I don't know. I, I still am not quite sure how to use Patreon beyond uploading videos and audio clips. We just started. Just we just started. started. But there are quite a few people who subscribe, so thank you. Uh, I would like to do more stuff on there. Um, yeah. But we'll, we're going to talk about last night's Drag Race on Patreon. Because we've been covering that. For people who don't know, we've been covering every episode of season 16 of Drag Race. We also covered True Detective season four. Intense investigative journalism, yes. Uh, any f we didn't watch the Wendy Williams documentary. Oh, is that out already? I think both parts are out. And then we need to watch. So we reviewed on our uh, podcast, Single Black Female. And now Lifetime released Single Black Female 2. So... <sighs> Candace's Revenge or something. So, I forget the character's name, but yeah. They're, they're Simone's Revenge. Revenge. Simone's Revenge, I think, is what it is. And what is but that, I'm excited about that, that Kenya Moore TV film? Oh, yeah. On, there's so much good <laughs> stuff I need to watch. Good. <laughs> uh, Fish Jelly turned down a cameo in J-Lo's movie. <laughs> that shit was terrible. It was really bad. And I know some film reviewers gave that movie high marks. I just don't know how. Never give up, Joe. I like. I just don't know. <laughs> so stupid. Fat Joe as a therapist was like, <laughs> it's bad. We didn't watch the Yolanda San Saldivar documentary either. I want to see that. There's just so much. There's a lot, yes. Always. Oh, well. Uh, I'm not excited about Beyonce's country era. I, I get it. She's reclaiming something but i it's just like kylie minogue's country album it's like no i am excited to order her um sacred hairline although they you know mama tina did their hair when they were younger and she did hair so i think she's the inspiration for the hair care line and they have a salon um beyonce has like a, a research salon i think like in Inglewood or it's oh. like a secret location secret as in it's not marked but there's like a building but there's like once you get inside there's a beautiful salon and uh they posted a video of uh, Tina Knowles doing Holly Robinson Pete's hair <laughs> and oh, the sure. end result was not <laughs> it was I was kind of surprised they posted it that like back when she styled her daughter and friends and Destiny's Child well, it was just like because she washed her and put like a treatment and then blow dried it and flat iron it. But that press was not very silky. So that was kind of. But then they also, Mama Tina also did Holly's son's hair. And that was cute because he has really big hair and it was really curly. That looked good. But Holly's hair looked like it needed one more pass with the flat. <laughs> but I'm very excited to uh, order the line just to try it. I think the packaging's nice and. As I would expect from her. Yeah, and I, I'm imagining the fragrances are really nice. And, and yeah. you can see how it compares to Taraji and um, what's, her, what's her name? Uh, so Tracy Ellis Tracy Ross has Ellis Ross. pattern and Taraji has uh, TPH. And I've ordered all of those products and used them. Um, pattern is not my favorite. Sorry, I, I've used it quite a bit and I didn't love any of it. Uh, and but I feel like pattern is more for like like wavy wavy hair I think even though Tracy Ellis Ross's hair is more coarse than that I feel like she was going for more universal textured hair Taraji's I like the like the weight of her conditioners and how her um like her she has like a master cleanse but the 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 master cleanse and conditioner is like it feels like half that bottle is peppermint oil. You should rub some on your head. Uh, oh, please. No, because it'll make you, I feel like I'm going blind. What's that shit in Paul Mitchell, the tea tree oil? Thing? Yeah. Okay. No, this is like you're pouring pure peppermint oil on your head. It's just way too strong. The fragrance is really strong. So, um, yeah, those are not my two favorite products. Um, but yeah, we'll see what Beyonce is doing. Oh, yeah. What if Beyonce would have hired me? I, you know, I did get an email a while back from a... Rec I've actually gotten emails recently, too, from, like, uh, recruiting agencies wanting, like, product development managers for, like, celebrity 
hair care brands. But you know, you have to sign an NDA before you can even discuss it. Oh, AI gave a thumbs up. Okay. Oh, because well, oh, you did. Or did I? What did I do? The I don't know. Um, but uh, oh. <laughs> or is someone else giving me a thumbs up? Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm so curious. Like who who I might have been working for. Uh, I haven't tried the uh, pattern hair care tools. I don't use a blow dryer. I just let myself air dry. Same. You know, when I do have an air dryer, uh, the only time I ever really use the blow dryer is if it's plugged in, like readily available, I'll blow dry my underarms. Okay. Because I don't like wet underarms, like after I got out of the shower. <laughs> oh, someone is thumbing up the video. That's um, or giving it a thumbs up. <laughs> I'm so late. Uh, yeah, see, like this wavy haired white woman says pattern works well for her. <laughs> That's what I think pattern is probably, like they're trying to appeal to all textured hair. Um, but yeah, that damn peppermint oil Taraji shit is like, like I'm in the shower blind. It feels good. And my hair, I've had you smell my hair a few times. Like, can you smell it? Because mm -hmm. I think it smells good, but yeah. it's so strong. <laughs> It feels good. Hi, Shirley. Well, um, this is a, a live that we're going to end soon. But I think we'll try to do like one a month. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, American Beauty? Oh, no. Oh, you're just ending it. You just... Oh, is there something else you want to no, say? No, I thought you just... Well... You give no warning. Well, I just did. Oh, Okay. You said soon, though, which implies like several minutes in the future. Oh, not not like immediately. But All done. Sure. All right. Bye.